All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Dalton. I'm the Assistant Director for Farmer Training and Development here at PASA. And we wanna thank you for joining us for today's session, uh, the fourth in our series on IPM perspectives uh, titled Vegetable Disease Identification and Prevention with Dr. Beth Cugino from Penn State and Penn State Extension. Um, we're really pleased to be able to offer this whole series. If you uh, missed any of the early, earlier sessions in this series, they are still available via our website for registration. And uh, eventually they'll end up on the PASA resources page. Um, for those of you who've joined us for previous uh, IPM sessions in, in prior summers, uh, all of those webinars are posted in the resources page as well. So a uh, real wealth of knowledge there for, for many of the issues you're probably experiencing. Um, we wanna thank you for joining us. Uh, if you don't mind uh, in the chat box, uh, introducing yourself, saying uh, who you are, uh, your farm name or organization name or, or association uh, where you're from helps people, uh, gives us a sense for where everyone's joining us from and, and maybe make some connections there. Uh, we will be taking questions throughout the session, both via the chat and the Q&A function. So whichever you'd prefer, please feel free to submit them there. We will be holding questions to the end though. So um, just stick around for the end and we'll, we'll answer any and all questions uh, that we get during the session. Uh, if you are using the Q&A function and you're, or you're monitoring that, you can upvote questions. Um, so if there is an issue that you're experiencing as well, you could also, you could upvote that so that it gets priority and, and be sure that it gets addressed. And then at the end of the session, we're going to be sharing a link to the evaluation for this presentation um, in the chat box. Please do grab that before you log off. It really does help us. Uh, we take it very seriously and we use it to develop future programming and improve uh, sessions like this so that we're um, doing the best job possible. So, uh, like I said, today's uh, presentation is by Dr. Beth Gugino from Penn State, uh, Professor and Extension Specialist in Vegetable Pathology. And uh, welcome, Beth. We'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Dan. And I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share a little bit about um, IPM and, and disease management with you here, uh, here this afternoon. So it's going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour. Um, I'll say in advance that, you know, I could probably give a presentation individually on any one of these individual slides, um, but hopefully it'll give you, you know, give you some framework for um, understanding disease management in the context of, of integrated, of integrated pest, uh, pest management. And so, you know, I tend to think about integrated pest management um, as a sustainable a science-based decision-making process that combines uh, the biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools um, to identify and manage uh, and reduce risk from pests and using pest management tools and strategies in a way that minimizes economic health and environmental risk. So it's a big, long, a big, long definition, um, and we're today going to kind of break it down in the context of uh, disease, uh, disease management. And so I tend to think about uh, integrated disease management in terms of several, uh, several different steps. The first step really is about, you know, accurately identifying the disease and understanding uh, pathogen, pathogen biology. If we, if we don't know what diseases we're anticipating coming um, or can identify what's, you know, causing issues in our, in our fields, then it becomes really hard I think to make management decisions in season, as well as thinking about what are you know future steps that we can take um, in the upcoming seasons to try to reduce some of those disease uh, diseases. And and it's important to also for, be familiar, you know, with what we see in the field. It can be very different than diseases that we see in a high tunnel. Um, you know, what are the common ones we see, you know, on the crops that you're commonly growing on your um, on your farm. And so I have a couple of slides that just show some pictures of what some of our, our common diseases are, as well as some of our common insect pests. Um, here are some, some that we see with uh, tomato. Um, so we have uh, leaf mold. Um, leaf mold, you, I would say we typically see it more commonly in a high tunnel than we do in the field, but it is something that we can see in the field. 
Uh, we always seem to have issues with bacterial diseases. So whether it's bacterial canker or bacterial spots, um, late blight is something that uh, we talked about a lot back in 2009, 2010. Um, we haven't really had too many outbreaks of that in the last in the last few years, which is which has been great, a uh, good thing to hear. Uh, some of the common uh, summer foliar diseases on tomato are, are early blight and septoria leaf spot. Uh, these are ones that tend to start on the lower parts of the plant and work their way up the plant and can lead to significant defoliation. Um, uh, timber rot is, is caused by uh, sclerotinia, uh, which has a really wide host range, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but this is one that survives in the soil for an extended period of time. So having accurate identification is important to come up with and management strategies for the future. Uh, this year, we saw a lot of issues with things like spider mites in high tunnels, uh, the, the higher temperatures, um, you know, a little bit less rainfall. We, we tended to see some more insect pest pressure. Um, and now at this time of year, seeing things like gray mold, uh, especially in our high tunnels with the with the higher relative relative humidities. Um, some of the common diseases and again insect pests that we see with cucurbit crops, um, I would say uh, Phytophthora blight is an increasingly uh, increasingly problematic. Um, downy mildew. Uh, these are both caused by pathogens that we call oomycetes, so they're more similar to water molds. Um, than they are to true fungi. Uh, of course, we have powdery mildew that we see every year. Um, some of our bacterial diseases like angular leaf spot, we also have bacterial leaf blight on pumpkin. Um, bacterial wilt, uh, which is vectored by a cucumber, cucumber beetle. It clogs the vascular system of the plant and causes a, a wilting during the heat of the day. Um, some of our insect pests, so squash vine borer, a squash bug. Um, plectosporium blight is something that we've been seeing on pumpkins a little bit more in the past a couple of years. A very distinct diamond-shaped pattern that occurs on the petioles and on the leaf veins on the underside of the leaves can cause this kind of white plaque uh, that can develop on the fruit itself. Um, and then we have fruit rots, uh, so fusarium fruit rot, um, black rot, which is also um, called uh, gummy stem blight. Uh, when it affects the vine parts of the plant. And again, just some, some cold crop uh, diseases and issues that we see, flea beetle, diamondback moth, cabbage looper are all really common. Um, black rot uh, is something that we got a number of reports about um, this past year um, on, on plants that are being plant, current plants that are being planted now for, for fall. Um, downy mildew, uh, alternaria leaf spot, um, and then club root is something that we see occasionally. So again, kind of getting a good sense of, you know, what are, what are some of the common uh, pest and disease issues that we see every year? Um, what are things that we can anticipate um, seeing as well? And so some kind of key concepts uh, about diseases is, like I said, they're caused by many different types of pathogens that we just kind of talked about. So we have fungal pathogens, bacterial pathogens, um, viruses, nematodes, uh, oomycetes. So like I said, these are more like water molds. Um, so they tend to prefer it cool and wet. We even have uh, pathogens called phytoplasmas, um, which are similar to a bacteria, but they have to be vectored by an insect pest. Um, so depending on what diseases we have, you know, we may have to focus on the pathogen for management, or in some cases we're focusing on managing the insect, um, the insect vector. But in all cases, um, pathogens require certain environmental conditions for growth, development, and reproduction. So, you know, depending on uh, the temperatures that we're experiencing or the amount of leaf wetness we have, um, it can really uh, vary what types of diseases we, we see or could anticipate seeing. So here's an example of bacterial spot um, and bacterial speck on tomato uh, in Pennsylvania. In a warmer summer, we may see more bacterial spots, but in a cooler summer, so here 64 to 75, we may see more bacterial speck. Or say uh, when it's hot and dry, we may see more issues with powdery mildew compared to when it's cool and wet, uh, then downy mildew may be more of an issue for us in, in cucurbits. 
Another kind of key concept is that pathogens have what we call a host range. Um, and that host range can be very, very large or it can be very small. And again, this, this kind of helps uh, govern what types of management practices we have available. Um, so some of our, our pathogens with larger host ranges would be uh, cucumber mosaic virus. Um, so it has a host range of over 800 different uh, types of plant species, um, including cucurbits, uh, and also white mold. So sclerotinia has a host range of over 400 plant species. And so that really kind of, uh, you know, dictates what some of our management practices can be. Um, compared to Fusarium solani, Formis specialis cucurbitae. So Formis specialis uh, means it's very specific. So it's very specific for cucurbits. So this particular Fusarium will only affect our cucurbit crops like pumpkin. A uh, similar here, this is black rot on coal crops. So Xanthomonas campestris, Pathovar campestris, only affects our brassica crops. So you're not going to see it moving from your cabbage, uh, say to your to your tomato to your tomato crop. So in those cases, a crop rotation can be a really effective uh, management tool. And all of this comes down to probably one of the most fundamental concepts um, in plant pathology and disease management, and that's uh, the disease triangle. So in order for, for disease to occur here in the center of the triangle, we have to have uh, the pathogen present, we have to have a, an environment that's favorable for that pathogen, and then we also have to have a susceptible host. And so when we're thinking you know, about integrated disease management, we're really thinking about breaking up this triangle in, in one or more uh, different sides. So kind of the second step to uh, integrated disease management is regular crop mount monitoring and, and scouting. And it, I think one of the first things you need to know um, is really what a healthy plant uh, should look like. And so in the upper uh, right hand picture, this is a, a picture of watermelon. Um, and I first saw this in a in a commercial field. I was kind of like, huh, that's kind of interesting. I had never seen any any uh, cultivar that looks like that. You know, to me, I might say, oh, that looks like it might be some type of spray damage or spray injury that's causing this this spotting. When actually, in fact, this particular cultivar is called, um, I think it's sun and stars or moon and stars, and that speckling is is the way it's supposed to look and part of a healthy plant. Um, I would say maybe for ornamental ornamentals, this is more challenging to know what a healthy plant's supposed to look like as opposed to one that may be um, having some issues. But really, you know, knowing what that healthy plant is is supposed to look like is is important. Also, thinking about scouting uh, highest risk areas first. So those might be cultivars uh, that you know are more susceptible to a particular disease. Um, it can be areas of the field that are lower or shaded by maybe a wooded edge. So areas that are gonna hold moisture longer on the leaves are tend to gonna be higher, higher risk for disease development. And so in this lower um, right-hand picture is a picture of uh, a pumpkin field that has two different cultivars. And the cultivar on the right is much more susceptible to powdery mildew than the cultivar on the left. And so if you're trying to, to you know, think about your time and time management, you know, scouting those most susceptible areas first for the diseases you're most likely to encounter um, is, is recommended. And also having a sense of maybe how different cultivars respond to environmental conditions. So this picture of, of tomatoes, um, these are two different tomato cultivars that are actually um, experiencing heat stress. And so the cultivar on the right uh, has the, what we call physiological leaf curl. So these leaves are curling as a result of kind of heat stress. Um, and in everything that I've read, this really doesn't lead to any type of yield reduction, but there's very much a difference in terms of, of cultivar susceptibility um, to, uh, to heat stress. It's also important to look at all parts of the plant. And this is uh, an example from a pumpkin trial that I had here at Rock Springs at the Penn State Research Farm. And as you can see throughout this field, I have a number of really uh, significantly yellowing and wilting, uh, wilting plants. Um, and so, you know, I took a closer look at those plants. I'm like, okay, could it be squash vine borer? You know, squash vine borer uh, gets into that crown causes damage, which can lead to then uh, yellowing and wilting. But I was scouting and I didn't see any squash vine borer. 
Um, so I took these plants and I dug them up and took a look at the roots. Um, and when I looked at the, at the crown and the roots of the plants, what I saw was a lot of this kind of pink coloring on these roots. Might be kind of hard to see in this picture, but this kind of pink coloring, kind of a lack of a significant root system um, was the result of fusarium crown and root rot. And so this is a soil borne pathogen that was occurring kind of in patches throughout the field um, and causing this kind of yellowing. But it's, it's important when you start seeing plants, especially cucurbits and things that are wilting and collapsing to really take a look at that crown and that root system to try to figure out um, what's going on. And so part of figuring out what's going on and, and knowing what to scout for is knowing what we're seeing in the area. Um, and, you know, I'm, as being part of part of uh, Penn State Extension, uh, we do a, a lot of information dissemination and we have um, various newsletters. So during the summer, I do a vegetable disease update that goes out once a week. Um, we also have uh, the Vegetable and Small Fruit Gazette newsletter uh, that you can sign up for at our Extension website. Um, we have a new podcast series called uh, Produce Pointers. Um, where a number of our extension educators will interview specialists about issues that we're seeing in the state. Um, I just recorded one on powdery mildew um, on cucurbit crops. Uh, we also have a 1-800-PEN-IPM hotline number that you can call, and every week I'll leave a voicemail uh, recording of issues that we're seeing on vine crops or on tomatoes and potatoes. Um, there's, I think there's are seven or eight different uh, voice mailboxes that you can listen to for issues, everything, you know, from tree fruit as well and, and small fruit. Um, I do have a, a Twitter uh, that I would say I'm not probably really good at leaving tweets on, but, but there are also um, various social media resources out there for learning and helping to guide you in terms of what you should be um, scouting for. Oh, we also... Um, work with a lot of plain sect growers. Um, and so at the produce auctions, at a number of the produce auctions, if you happen to have one close by you, uh, we have these educational kiosks um, where we post information at weekly. Um, and we also have a, a newsletter flyer called PA Produce Grower um, that you can pick up and, and take with you again, summarizing some of the issues that we're seeing in the, in the state. Um, we also have uh, pest and disease monitoring and forecasting uh, information, which I'll talk about here a little bit in the next in the next slide. So again, kind of knowing um, and paying attention to what disease alerts, insect pest alerts are coming out will help guide you in terms of, of scouting. Um, and we do have a website um, for specific diseases. Uh, we have one here for USA Blight is uh, dedicated to late blight on tomatoes and potatoes. Um, and we also have uh, the cucurbit downy mildew um, forecast homepage. Um, and this is a, a monitoring resource that I'm very involved with where uh, you can report um, where you're finding downy mildew on what cucurbit crops. Um, and we have uh, then forecasts that are generated to help predict risk. So how at risk are you for downy mildew developing on say cucumbers um, versus something like uh, a pumpkin? And the reason that these resources are so important in terms of, of scouting is for, for downy mildew in particular, um, this pathogen can get picked up uh, in the wind trajectories and can travel long, long distances and so that's kind of what's depicted here in the schematic um, where you have an infected crop. Uh, those spores get picked up and these can travel for hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles up the East Coast. They can then wash out um, in various rain events and then affect our, say, cucumbers um, or our pumpkin crop here. And for this particular disease, really, uh, fungicides are our primary tool. Um, whether you're a conventional grower or an organic grower. Um, we do have a, a few uh, newer cultivars with host resistance that are coming out, but really for managing this disease, it's about kind of timing um, fungicide applications, you know, when we're at, at highest risk. And so we have um, pretty extensive monitoring network associated, associated with this with various cucurbit crops. Um, we get confirmations you know, through our plant disease clinics and stakeholder stakeholder reports. 
Uh, we've recently engaged with master gardeners and citizen scientists that in their gardens or community gardens, if they're detecting um, cucurbit downy mildew, we ask for them to report um, so that then we can use this information to better inform um, forecasting. You know, if you need some help with identification, identifying diseases that are occurring on your crops, there's a couple of, of good resources. Um, this is a, the Northeast Vegetable and Strawberry Pest Identification Guide is a great kind of pictorial guide. Um, it can be downloaded uh, as a PDF file um, and is, a, is a resource for helping. Uh, there's an older resource here called Identifying Diseases of Vegetables. Um, this has kind of been on my bucket list uh, to update. Um, it's still on that bucket list to update, uh, again, a visual guide to help with, with identification. Um, if you still need more help, uh, Penn State, we have the Plant Disease Clinic. It's actually uh, located right across from my, uh, right across the hall from my office. I'm here in Buckout Lab, uh, but Sarah May is our, di our, our uh, the director of the clinic and our lead diagnostician and Jenny Mazzoni. Um, we'll take a shot at trying to identify and help you figure out what's going on with your crops. And there's a, a specimen uh, clinic form that you can uh, download and fill out and send in then with your, um, with your sample. And so really with this, I stress that it's important to have an accurate diagnosis um, in terms of, of what you're dealing with to then make you know, future management um, decisions. So that's kind of the, the, the second step in, in, in IPM is, is monitoring. We think about our third step, and, and this kind of falls more true with, I would say, insect uh, insect pests is really kind of establishing economic uh, thresholds. And, and I'm not sure if in, in the insect IPM session, they, the, the speakers spoke about economic thresholds, but it's really kind of identifying at what point has that population reached a level that it's important to manage it um, so that you don't reach a level that then causes crop loss. And I'd like to say that we have this uh, clearly defined for diseases, but really I think diseases are much more difficult to manage, you know, when it comes to trying to identify, okay, at what level of disease severity should I start trying to manage? Most of our tools really um, are about managing preventatively and thinking about, you know, preventative management or when we very, you know, when we first start to see symptoms. So usually with powdery mildew, I recommend, you know, if you're scouting a field, you know, you scout 50 leaves in a field. And if you see one powdery mildew colony on a leaf, you know, that's enough to trigger a management program. Um, because it's much easier to manage powdery mildew when the, the disease pressure is really low than to wait for it to get too uh, to wait for it to get too um, too high. Uh, there are this is another website that that may be a useful tool um, in helping to determine if weather conditions are favorable for certain diseases. Uh, it's the Northeast um, uh, weather uh, Association. It's a network of weather stations that are across the Northeast. Uh, here in the lower right is a is a picture, and each of these kind of little dots is a specific weather station. And you can use the weather data uh, at those weather stations to run various models, um, disease models, uh, uh, insect models. Um, it can look at growing degree days, um, and so you can try to maybe find a site that's that's closest to where your farm is. Um, and play around and get a sense of when are conditions favorable, you know, for certain diseases or for certain insect pests, again, to help, help you make um, management decisions. So step four um, in terms of integrated disease management is really the selection of disease management um, tactics or, or strategies. And, and we tend to follow what we call this IPM pyramid where we start at the bottom and we're really thinking about implementing as many cultural practices as possible, you know, physical and mechanical practices as possible in terms of being preventative. So trying to prevent disease from developing in the first place. And then as we work our way up the triangle, we're now talking about intervention. So, you know, are there um, biorational products or are there conventional chemistries that we should be applying, you know, if we're anticipating a certain disease or if we start to see symptoms in the, in the field. Um, and so we go from prevention um, to intervention in management. And I would say by far the majority of the tools that we use um, are in this prevention, kind of this lower tier of the, 
of the um, IPM triangle. And so probably one of the most um, fundamental or uh, practices for disease management is the implementation of host resistance. Um, if there are ever cultivars available that have resistance to diseases that we're experiencing, that's kind of your first, the first step in disease management. So, you know, selecting cultivars that are adapted for this particular growing region um, and that then have resistance if it's available. And I tend to think about host resistance on a continuum. So the continuum from being uh, completely susceptible um, to being resistant. And in the middle, you kind of have this category called tolerance, which means that uh, symptoms may develop on the plant, um, but it doesn't necessarily lead to yield loss. Um, and I always like to point out that uh, resistance uh, does not equal immunity. Um, so just because you have a cultivar that indicates that it has resistance to a particular disease, it doesn't mean that it's not gonna get that disease. So hopefully if, if the disease develops, um, it's later in the season or it's not as severe, therefore it's a little bit easier, uh, easier to man manage. And then an example I always like to point out is, this is a, a late blight trial um, that I had back in, in 2012 now. Um, but what you can see is that in this in the center, uh, the center row here of this three set of three, um, the cultivar in front uh, is Mountain Mountain Fresh Plus, um, which has no resistance to pretty much anything. Um, as soon as it sees late blight, it dies. And so here this front plot is completely dead. Um, but then if you look further back this row, um, these are other uh, cultivars of tomato um, that have resistance genes for, um, for late blight. And so there were no fungicides that have been applied to any of these plots further back in the row. And you can see wherever there was Mountain Fresh Plus, or in this case, uh, my guard rows or these side rows are a susceptible processing cultivar. Um, you have significant disease, significant loss versus those that have host resistance um, to, um, to late blight. You know, uh, basil downy mildew was another example. Um, there's been a lot of work in the last uh, decade um, to develop uh, resistance um, to basil downy mildew. And Rutgers has come out with a number of cultivars. Um, and there's every year there's an increasing number of cultivars uh, on, the, on the market. And so this is, if you're not familiar, this is what it looks like. You get this kind of yellowing on the upper leaf surface of the basil. I tend to think it, it looks like a nutrient deficiency um, until you flip those leaves over and you see this purpley gray sporulation on the, under, on the underside of the leaf. And if you take a, a closer look at some of the resistant cultivars, um, what you see is that there's significantly less to no sporulation on the underside of this, um, of these, of these leaves. So uh, an excellent tool um, for managing uh, basil downy mildew. You know, another point to make about, um, about host resistance is that uh, bacterial pathogens can be really complex. Um, and an example of this is a bacterial leaf spot on pepper. And with bacterial leaf spot on pepper, we know that there are at least 10 different races of the pathogen. And so when you're selecting for host resistance, um, it's, it's hard uh, to capture all of those races. And, and so there are a few different uh, bell pepper cultivars that have resistance to phytophthora blight, which is another significant disease of pepper, um, and then also has resistance to races one through 10 of bacterial uh, leaf spot. Um, there are some that have resistance to phytophthora, but then only have resistance to you know, a select number of bacterial leaf spot uh, races. And so if you call me and say, Beth, you know, I have, um, I think I have bacterial leaf spot on my, on my plants, you know, what do you, what do you think? Um, I'm going to probably ask you what cultivar you have, because I'm interested in figuring out what race uh, you might have. And, and then in terms of recommending other cultivars, maybe to try in the future that have maybe a larger resistance um, profile, because uh, this, this disease can be really uh, challenging to manage. Um, once it gets established uh, in a in a field, it's really kind of copper-based products that are, are our primary our primary tool. 
Um, grafting is another option uh, for in terms of host resistance. We're seeing a lot uh, more interesting growers using grafted plants. Um, you can graft plants uh, for soil borne pathogens, uh, for nematode, for nematode issues, um, even just general plant vigor. Uh, the the uh, root stocks can can um, help uh, impart resistance uh, to these various um, pathogens onto the top part or that or that scion. So especially in I would say uh, high tunnel uh, production situations where you're trying to maximize maximize yield, um, that's where we're seeing more and more grafting. So whether it's tomatoes or whether or whether it's it's cucumbers, um, and also in situations where we tend not to see as much crop rotation like we do in a high tunnel, um, that can, uh, grafting can be an important tool. So kind of moving, moving along in terms of other preventative, uh, preventative tactics, you know, thinking about crop rotation, um, you know, and I tend to think about crop rotation also in terms of cropping sequence. So if you have cover crops that you're using between your cash crops, you need to think about what that plant family is, you know. So if you're growing um, snap beans, and then you have a legume uh, cover crop, from a pathogen standpoint, that's not crop rotation. Um, the you know pathogens that go to snap beans, you know, are going to go to any type of leguminous um, cover crop. So really, with crop rotation, we're thinking about trying to back, uh, break up those pathogen life cycles. So we need to think about rotating um, by crop family. Um, so, you know, thinking about if you have snap beans, okay, maybe you do some type of, um, uh, you know, barley or wheat type of cover crop, um, grain crop in, in between those, those snap bean, uh, those snap bean crops. And if you're thinking about, you know, crop rotation for reducing a certain soil borne uh, diseases, um, it can be challenging depending on the type of of pathogen that you're working with. So if you're if if the pathogen that's been identified, so say white mold or sclerotinia, you know, we talked about it having this really wide host range, um, you know, it can then be a little bit more challenging to manage using host uh, using crop rotation um, because there's fewer crops that you can consider that are going to help reduce that pathogen population as opposed to um, pathogens that are, are only go to a couple of hosts. So you could say, I can rotate out of tomato and I can go to cucumber or and I could go to broccoli, you know, before I go back in. So just again, something to think about is you're trying to devise uh, crop rotations and cropping sequences um, in terms of disease management. Um, it's also important to invest a lot in improving overall um, soil uh, soil health, and it's obviously no surprise, you know, that we're seeing um, you know uh, shifts in climate. Um, this is some older data now, um, but looking at you know shifts in extreme storms um, from 1948 to 2011, you know, it's no surprise that in the Northeast we're experiencing larger storms at a more frequent rate. Um, and so then it results in fields that look like these on the on the right. Um, the lower right is my onion field at the research farm. Um, I would I, I'm the first to admit that we do not have the best soils at our research farm. Um, and we have a lot of issues that when we get heavy rains, you know, we get flooding. Um, and that that you know that's not a good situation um, in terms of disease management. Um, also, just general uh, plant plant health. Um, so what are, you know, what are ways that we can improve and, and focus on improving our soil health um, in the long term um, to help with uh, disease management? And really we're shooting, you know, for soils that are resistant to degradation and resilient when these unfavorable conditions occur. You know, when we get an inch, inch and a half, two inches of rain really quickly, you know, that's not good for anybody, but how, you know, how fast can our soils rebound? Um, from that type of, of situation. And, and this is, these are some pictures from Ray Weil, um, who is a soil scientist at the University of Maryland, who's been retired for a long time now. But, you know, he really, these pictures demonstrate the importance of having organic matter in the system. Um, and so here's a soil that's been in conventional corn for 25 years, compared to one that has, you know, bluegrass and then conventional corn. So basically a lot more organic matter. And so you can imagine if you have this significant rain event, you know, the soils saturate. So here in this lower uh, right-hand picture, 
And you can imagine now, you know, when that water drains away, you know, this, the soil with low organic matter is basically going to be this brick, right? Versus the soil on the right that has higher organic matter, you know, it's, it's going to be more resilient. Um, you know, when that water dry, you know, drains away, the, the soil conditions are going to be much more, uh, much more favorable. And so, you know, what are things that we can do to improve, um, you know, the health of our soil over time? And I know, you know, PAS has been highly uh, engaged, you know, in, in improving soil, improving soil health. And so again, like I said, each one of these slides, I feel like could be an entire talk on itself. So, um, you know, really, we want to think about ways that we can, you know, use our crop rotations, you know, use organic amendments, cover cropping, reduce tillage to think about, you know, the, the long term, uh, improving the long term health um, of our soils, which in turn, you know, improves plant health and then reduces, you know, some of the disease, uh, disease issues that we um, that we tend to tend to see. And I kind of like this, like this figure and kind of the additive effect. So we think about you know, you know, cover cropping is maybe a low hanging fruit and something that can be incorporated into our production systems. You know, thinking then about, you know, reducing tillage, you know, can reduce tillage um, both in time and space. You know, some crops, you know, especially maybe small seeded crops, we really do have to pretty intensely till to be able to get those crops established. But maybe there's some other ones like pumpkins, we can do reduced till when we do pumpkins. Um, and you know how do we how do we uh, kind of get the synergistic and additive effect of these in terms of investing in our uh, in our soil health? And there are some really good resources out there um, from SARE, um, so building soils for better crops. If you're not familiar with it, and also managing cover crops profitably are really good resources um, to read just to gain a better understanding of of soils and soil um, soil health. So. There's my my plug my plug for those and and they're very easy um, easy reads uh, and grow, grower friendly so it's so kind of moving on in terms of of you know preventative tactics so we're still thinking about the base of this IPM triangle and and um, sanitation is another one of these kind of fundamental things we need to think about you know especially when it comes to bacterial diseases which I would say are probably some of our um, more challenging diseases to manage. Uh, we have to think about managing them and thinking about sanitation, you know, from seed to transplant production um, from in the field. And, and here are a couple of pictures uh, on the right. The bottom is uh, kale. These are, are kale transplants um, uh, with black rot associated with them. And then the tomatoes um, in the upper right have a bacterial spot. And in both of these cases, really, you know, there's no chance of being able to plant these out into the field and, and be able to yield a crop. Um, it's just going to be, uh, you're never going to catch up in this type of, of situation. You know, so in these cases, you know, the grower, it's best just to, to you know, discard these plants and start fresh, um, start fresh again. Um, it's just an uphill, an uphill battle. And so a lot of these bacterial pathogens we know can be associated with the, with the seed. Um, and we do have um, some tools to help us uh, with the seed. I will say that seed companies aren't trying to sell us seed that has bacterial pathogens with it. Um, we work with seed companies all the time to try to reduce risk, um, but really it's a needle in a haystack. It can be, you know, one seed in 10,000 can cause significant losses in the, in the field. So it's really about, um, you know, detecting the, de detecting the pathogen in these, in these lots. But as growers, you know, we can surface disinfect, uh, disinfest seed. Um, there's also uh, hot water uh, seed treatments that can be used to reduce um, potential load of the bacteria that are under the seed coat or associated with the seed. Uh, there are specific uh, temperature and time durations associated depending on the type of seed you're working you're working with. And this has to do with if you go, uh, too high of a temperature for too long, um, it can cause issues with uh, seed vigor um, in, seed germ in seed germination. You know, during um, transplant production, um, you know, we need, to, we need to, even if we're not seeing symptoms on our transplants, we need to kind of act like there are bacterial pathogens always there. So just kind of being careful not to intermix 
uh, cultivars, kind of keep cultivars separate. That way, in case you do have issues with one seed lot, you can discard those and not have them spread around. Um, you know, making sure that you're using clean flats, um, high quality planting material. Uh, we know uh, bacterial bacteria can survive in wooden surfaces. Um, so if you have a lot of wood in your greenhouse or in your production structure, um, and you have an outbreak of some of these bacterial diseases, um, they can persist that way. Um, and sanitizing, sanitizing the greenhouses is, is really um, important. So I almost think that, you know, you know, hospital clean is what we should be shooting for when we're trying to think about bacterial pathogens. Obviously, we're never going to hit that mark by any means, but thinking, you know, as clean as you can possibly keep things, um, the, the less issues you're going you're gonna to potentially have. Then also thinking about sanitation as we move into the move into the field. Um, so things like uh, having coal piles, um, you know, coal piles nearby uh, production fields. There's pathogens that can be here that can uh, sporulate and, and move into our production fields. Um, thinking about what are water sources uh, for irrigation. Um, so we know that if uh, that Phytophthora blight, Phytophthora capsaicae. Uh, can survive in surface water irrigation sources. So in this picture, kind of in the lower center, um, we're actually uh, baiting for Phytophthora um, in this water source. So here's the intake um, for the irrigation. And this is actually, uh, it's a have a heart trap um, with little floaters on it. And then we have like cucumbers and um, rhododendron leaves in there, which are very susceptible to Phytophthora. And we float this in the water source uh, for you know, 24, 48 hours, pull it out and look and see if Phytophthora develops. Because um, you could be just irrigating Phytophthora onto your, onto your field. Um, in a well situation, we don't tend to see that, but it could be an issue in surface, in surface water. In terms of um, sanitation, again, this upper picture here of a high tunnel, you know, this grower has moved from the high tunnel out into the field and has just let this go. Um, and that's fine, except you know there can be a lot of diseases in here that can then carry over to the next to the next year. Um, and also with equipment. So thinking about um, in this case, this is a, this is a, a cabbage a cabbage field. Um, there's a lot of uh, soil caked on these tires. If you're moving between fields, moving equipment between fields, um, it's very easy to move soil-borne pathogens um, between fields. And we tend to think about that also with shared equipment um, and contract spraying. Um, so again, if you have if you have equipment that's being commonly used across multiple fields, across multiple growers, it's important to think about what pathogens can be moved around as a result as a result of that. Um, we're also thinking about implementing and using you know physical and mechanical tactics in our in our um, IPM programs. Again, looking to break up pathogen life cycles by altering the environment. So using things like straw mulch between the rows, um, using row covers. So in this case, this is a trial. I'm um, using row covers uh, for excluding um, cucumber beetles for managing bacterial wilt, um, using plastic mulch, um, again, you know, to help reduce some of the splashing of soil onto the, onto the plants. Um, there's a lot of uh, reduced till, no-till pumpkins and cucurbits now that are being planted. And this, this physical mulch uh, barrier between the soil and the fruit itself can do a lot to reduce fruit rots. It also um, will help protect the fruits and keep it more clean so that post-harvest you might not have to do so much cleaning of those fruit you know, before they go um, to market. And we've also seen, I do a lot of uh, work with bacterial diseases of onion um, that, you know, we can uh, influence the amount of disease we see uh, based on the type of plastic mulch we're using. So we know that these bacterial diseases like higher soil temperatures, so black plastic, um, we tend to see the most bacterial disease on compared to black biodegradable, um, any type of reflective mulch. Um, tends to we tend to see the least disease on on these kind of reflective mulches there also tends to be less thrips pressure um, because with with the reflective mulch the um 
the, it masks the canopy of the plant a bit and the and thrips have a harder time finding that foliage as compared to say black, um, black plastic. Um, we also have other techniques um, such as anaerobic soil disinfestation. And this is some uh, a technique that I've been involved with in working with um, Dr. Francesco de Goya, um, specifically in high tunnels and managing uh, soil-borne pathogens in high tunnels where we tend not to see as much crop rotation. And the idea here um, is that you're using uh, carbon sources. So in this case, this is um, composted um, poultry manure and and molasses, so uh, animal feed grade molasses, and you apply this to these pre-made beds, um, you incorporate it, and then you cover it with this, what's called TIF plastic, which is basically um, an impermeable film. And then you use the irrigation tape to flood the beds for a period of time, creating these anaerobic conditions, which then knock back pathogen populations. And then several weeks later, you can punch holes in this plastic, let it air out a little bit, and then you can come in and plant your crop. And it's a way to kind of reduce some of the pressures that we're seeing from these, these soil-borne pathogens, but not having to, you know, remake beds multiple times in a, in a high tunnel. And so this is something that we're actively looking to see, you know, how we can fit it into our production systems um, here in the, in the Northeast. You know, another potential tool um, is the use of, of biofumigant crops. And so this is the idea of incorporating um, specific cover crops as a green manure. And as those particular crops break down, um, they produce these um, chemicals. So in this case, uh, with brassicas, it's isothiocyanates. Um, and with Sudan grass, it's actually hydrogen cyanide. So these are very similar to chemical fumigants, but they're biologically derived. And that those volatile chemicals then will suppress um, the pathogen, uh, the pathogen populations. And so, you know, the idea is they work very similar to a chemical fumigant, but like I said, they're biologically derived. A lot of times you would do, you know, you do this kind of a two-pass mow and incorporate system pack the soil down a little bit, hope for a little bit of rain to kind of seal that soil surface. Then you get that volatile activity, knocks back the population, and then you can come back a couple of weeks later and implant into, into that. So kind of moving on into kind of these, these upper tiers um, of management. Um, so we've you know, talked a lot about preventative, um, preventative strategies. You know, now we've been scouting and it's during the season and we see some particular diseases. You know, what can we do to try to, to manage them during, during the season? And so um, we have a lot of you know, bio, bio rational types of products as well as con conventional chemistries that can be, um, can be deployed. And the idea here is we're really looking to reduce what we call this secondary spread of the pathogen. And by doing that, we then also reduce what we call primary inoculum. And so that's, that's the pathogen that's present at the very beginning of the season that kind of gets the disease going. Um, so in this case of early blight on tomato, we have our primary inoculum, which can be crop residue. Um, and then, you know, this, from this crop residue, you know, the pathogen will, will initiate disease um, on the plants. You'll get these uh, lesions with these spores, and this is kind of that club-shaped spore that you get. And all of these spores then can be splashed, dispersed up higher on the plants, in the plant canopy, between plants. And so when we're applying a product during the season, we're trying to knock back these spores. So that we don't have as much disease uh, disease pressure, and then in doing that, you know, we reduce the amount of disease that's associated with the crop residue that could cause problems with us the next year. We also, I would say, have the option to rogue out plants. So when you first start to see disease when you're scouting, you know, you can take out uh, the most infected plants, or you could take out. Uh, symptomatic plant parts. Really, it, it kind of depends on the size of production that you're that you're working with, whether or not that's a viable um, a viable option. 
Uh, one thing I want to remind everybody uh, is, you know, recently the Pennsylvania Department of Ag kind of updated and broadened um, the term, its term greenhouse to call it enclosed space. And so what this means is that in order to apply a particular product in what they're calling an enclosed space, um, it has to be labeled for, for greenhouse use. Um, it used to be like specifically with a high tunnel, you know, if those sides were up on the high tunnel, you could get away with a product that was labeled in the field, um, but that's not the case anymore. And really it has to do with worker protection safety, that the fact that there is a covering that's over top of you um, when you're applying that product, you know, the ones that are labeled for greenhouse are going to be the be the be the safest. So, um, just wanted to, to to point that out. There's always been a little bit of confusion um, confusion about that. And in our um, most recent 2022-23 uh, uh, commercial vegetable production guide, um, we actually have a table here on page um, 147 that lists uh, has kind of a comprehensive list of products that have a greenhouse label. To them that can be applied um, in that particular uh, situation. So, so a little bit more about um, products that we have available to us, you know, for managing during the season. Um, of course, we have uh, synthetic fungicides. Um, so, kind of our conventional chemistries. Um, we have microbial biopesticides. So, these are the microorganisms that function as an actual kind of biocontrol agent against the pathogen. Um, we have biochemical biopesticides. So these are more of our naturally occurring substances. So things like potassium bicarbonate, um, plant extracts, botanical, uh, botanical oils that will affect the pathogens. And kind of a misnomer is just because something is kind of classified as a biopesticide does not necessarily mean that it's, it can be used in certified organic production. So a little bit um, about how some of these products work. Um, so there's a lot of, um, of products that are labeled as protectants. And so what happens is that they will protect the plant at the point um, where they come in contact with the plant. So here's a product, are these red dots? You know, you've, you've sprayed them onto the plant. As that plant continues to grow, that new growth is no longer protected. So you have to come back through and reapply a particular product to again, be able to protect that, that, newer, that newer growth. And there's a lot of um, our multi-site mode of action products like copper and sulfur and chlorothalonil work this way. Um, a lot of our biologically based products are also gonna work this way, that they're gonna be protectants. And so they'll need to be reapplied on a regular basis to protect that that new growth. Um, there are other products that are absorbed into the plant um, to different degrees and are a little bit more targeted for certain types of pathogens. Um, so some products are what we call translaminar. And so these are products that you would apply to the plant surface and they, they penetrate through that leaf and they'll protect the lower leaf surface. So if we think about a disease like powdery mildew on, on pumpkins, if you apply a product on the upper surface of the leaf, it'll help protect, protect and reduce spore production on the lower surface. Um, there's also some products that are considered systemic. There's really not that many of them, but a systemic product is one that you could apply uh, through, say, the drip irrigation, and it would actually move up through the plant and protect those upper parts of the plant. And these tend to be, um, like I said, targeted. Uh, and they tend to have very specific modes of action. So these are ones that we tend to be most concerned about in terms of um, fungicide, fungicide resistance. Um, but in terms of biopesticides, and there's a lot of different modes of action in terms of how uh, biopesticides function. So there's a number that uh, function by antibiosis. So that basically means that one organism produces products that are uh, antagonistic or detrimental to another organism. Here's a picture, um, kind of a classic picture of what we what's done in the lab, where here's a fungal pathogen that's growing across a plate. And here are some bacterial biocontrols that are preventing that fungus from kind of growing in its, in its space. And so there are a number of, of different products that kind of function 
um, have that as a mode, a mode of action. Um, there's also products that function in terms of parasitism and, and predation. Um, so either, these are tend to be microbial products. So trichoderma is a classic example of this. And that uh, the trichoderma is this very thin fungal hyphae that you see here. And it actually has penetrated into rhizoctonia. And so this is a rhizoctonia hyphae. It's much larger. Here's our trichoderma. It's actually feeding um, and directly parasitizing uh, the trichoderma or the, the rhizoctonia, excuse me. Um, we also have bacteriophage, and these are kind of these spaceship looking things. Um, there are viruses that are very specific to bacteria. This is something that's actually commonly used now in greenhouses in Florida, where they have a lot of copper resistance. Um, we also have uh, fungal parasites. So Coniothyra and minitans is actually a fungus that feeds on another fungus. And so in this case, um, this is sclerotinia that's developing sclerotia and uh, the mycoparasite is, is, feeding, is feeding on there. Um, we also have competitive exclusion as a mode of action. So basically you're you know, colonizing uh, the surface of the plant with one or multiple microbes. Um, and it's out competing the pathogen um, for resources. And there's actually uh, some research that's being done in our department. I'm on a, on a student committee where she is looking to capture all of the microbes that are on the surface of a tomato leaf and expose it, expose them to bacterial spot pathogen repeatedly and create a microbial population that's suppressive to bacterial spot. And then can we apply, so rather than a single organism, can we apply a community of organisms to help provide this, this protection against the, against the pathogen? Um, and then we also have um, you know, contact uh, biopesticides. So these are kind of our biochemical um, types of products. So these are stylet oils, mill stop. Um, these are really effective against, uh, say, powdery mildew types of pathogens, because powdery mildew, the pathogen is really, uh, uh, a lot of it is on the surface of that leaf. And so you can smother it with these oils or with potassium bicarbonate and really kind of knock back that, that pathogen pressure. Um, and then we also have, you know, products that uh, induce resistance. So they're, they're inducing basically the defense mechanisms of the plant. Um, and there's, it's, a, it, it's pretty complicated how they, how they function, um, but products like Regalia, Lifeguard, Double Nickel, basically you're um, inducing the plant's ability to respond when that pathogen, when it senses that pathogen um, is present. And so in, in the case of these products, you actually have to start applying them much earlier in the season. So very, very much preventatively, because you're kind of priming the plant's defense responses for when it's exposed to that particular pathogen. So kind of some of our best practices, you know, for using some of these biopesticides is really, you know, they need to be used preventatively. And like I just said, with those defense inducing, um, induce, inducing products, it's not the case where you necessarily wait to see an issue and then you start applying the product. And really they're best used as a component of an integrated disease or pest management program, which is what we've been talking about this entire webinar. Um, so by, by layering on all these other management tools, you're then able, um, the bio, biopesticides are gonna probably be the most effective in that type of situation. Also thinking about um, you know, how you, you need to follow the label. So a lot of these products contain active organisms. And so you have to think about where you're storing them how you're storing them. Um, when you mix them, you know, you need to mix them right before you use them. They really shouldn't sit in, in, a, in a sprayer for very long. Um, you have to be thoughtful in terms of what you're tank mixing them with. And a lot of this information will be on the label. You know, this can or can't be applied with copper. And then you really wanna, you know, you, after you use these types of products, um, you really wanna be scouting the fields and seeing, right, is it even working? Um, you know, is, is it working the way I, I wanted it to work? Because there's a lot of reasons why products may or may not work. Um, it may be due to the product itself or resistance, or it could often have to do with how we applied it. You know, did we start applying things too late? I've mistimed things in my, in my trials. And, and when there's too much disease pressure, you know, there's a lot of products that just, just don't work. 
and that's you know conventional to biopesticides. You just you miss time things, or you know your spray intervals are too long. Um, that could be because you know you couldn't get in the field because it was too wet, um, or you missed a spray for whatever for whatever reason. Um, there's also issues with you know inadequate spray coverage, uncalibrated sprayers, you know nozzles that are clogged. Um, not a high enough spray volume for, for your the canopy. So the product may actually work, but you're not really getting it to where it needs to be or getting the coverage that you need for it to be um, to be effective. So really that kind of takes us to this this fifth step and that's really you know recording and evaluating your results and making maps, right? I, I used to think I could remember a lot of things about what I was doing with my field research. But really, I can't remember anymore from the day of planting to the day of harvest. So I really try to write things down. Um, you know, did you know whatever you implemented? Did it have the desired effect? You know, were there unintended side effects? You know, what would you maybe do differently? This is a scenario um, in a field uh, last year where they were growing. This grower was growing pumpkins and was trying, you know, to do this kind of green cover in the row middles that he uh, sprayed back to try to create this kind of mulch um, to prevent erosion, make it easier to get into the field. Um, I think, you know, in this case, he wasn't really too happy with it. It really, it, it, it created too much moisture within the canopy. Um, I think he would have wanted to mow it down a little bit uh, more closely to the ground to get a little bit more mulch down. So these are kind of the things that you try them and then you kind of take, you know, take some notes um, to see, you know, how would I do it differently um, this, this next year. And so really when we're thinking about um, integrated disease management, we're really looking in integrated pest management in general, you know, we're looking to use multiple strategies to reduce losses. And so whether it's diseases, whether it's insects, whether it's weeds, within the season or between seasons, you know, everything is interrelated. Um, and so with this kind of schematic graph here, really what we're looking to do is we're both looking to reduce, you know, disease pressure at the beginning of the season. And so this is time. And so if we reduce disease pressure, disease might not develop till later in the season. So that's this, this red line here. Or if disease develops, it's at a slower rate which is this green line. And so really what we're hoping to do is push disease back to later in the season and have it not be as, as severe so it's easier, easier for us to manage. And that's kind of what the primary goal is um, when we're, when we're uh, implementing um, integrated disease management. And kind of this is my final slide. And really uh, integrated pest management, you know, we talked about what I would say is a small piece of the puzzle here in green, specifically with, with diseases, but people are now thinking about integrated pest management in a much larger, uh, much larger context. Um, you know, so what does it mean as a producer, but what does it mean as the consumer, the seller, you know, what types of, of social, economic, and environmental safety implications are there for, for the different strategies um, that, we're, they're in, well, that we're implementing? Um, and really, you know, successful pest and disease management doesn't happen by accident. It, you know, it's something that we're constantly, you know, trying to to fine tune and, and trying um, to manage um, successfully. And so, with that, um, you know, have a happy continued, <laughs> a happy, uh, healthy, successful growing season. I feel like you know we're here almost at the end of end of August already. I'm not quite sure how that um, how that happened, but um, I'm uh, open to taking any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Beth. Um, if you wouldn't mind ending your screen share. Okay, there we go. Um, somebody did let us know that the chat was blocked early on for folks, but it should be open for everyone in the audience to share any questions uh, now, or you can use the Q&A. Um, I've got a couple questions here, and we'll start with the first one from the Q&A zone. Um, does Penn State Extension serve other state residents? Yeah, so so Penn State uh, Penn State Extension uh, services the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, whether you're a commercial commercial grower, um, homeowner, um, I I tend to focus uh, most of my efforts with commercial production, uh, but I also work very closely uh, with master gardeners that support um, you know home gardens, community gardens, those types of things, yep. Okay. 
Um, if somebody did have a question from out of the state, is that something you can entertain or would you pass that along to a peer in, in the other in another state? Yeah, so I think um, I, I can handle that as well as I would copy in, uh, depending on the type of question, if there's somebody, you know, uh, there's vegetable pathologists in all of the states. And so, you know, you, I would reach out to your local extension um, community you know, first, or I can help direct you in that direction. Okay. Um, you mentioned the, the phytoplasms and the oomyces. <laughs> um, is there anything, I mean, those, those are probably the newest things for that folks haven't uh, either studied up on or are relatively new. Uh, do you have any other commentary or, or anything to be on the lookout for or any, yeah, anything on, on either of those? Uh, so, oh, oh my seeds. I mean, people used to just lump them as fungi, and we used to always talk about them as, as fungi. But really, I mean, oh, my seeds are just, they're just very different. They're biologically very different. And I have started separating them out because especially with conventional chemistries, uh, the products that you would, you would apply for managing powdery mildew really won't do anything for downy mildew and vice versa. And so that's why I tend to try to really distinguish um, try to distinguish them. Okay. Um, you mentioned some great stuff about making sure that your equipment is working and functioning properly and all of that. Um, what would you say are like the one or two most common things that are, are holding people's um, application of materials back? Yeah, I would, I would say um, sprayer calibration. So, you know, making, making sure that, that, you know, that the rate of product that's on the label is actually what's getting onto the getting onto the crop, and and so it's really important. And there's there's a lot, uh, Penn State Extension has a lot of great resources to help with calibrating, um, you know, the smallest of small backpack sprayers, you know, to large tractor uh, tractor sprayers. Um, so that and then and making sure you're getting good coverage, and and especially. Uh, if you're focused on using biopesticide types of products where really, you know, coverage is critical. Um, and so again, that's where that sprayer calibration, enough volume of water um, is going to be really important. Um, I imagine that probably also includes, you know, in terms of reading the label, managing your water's pH and the temperature and all of that. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could say anything more about increasing the efficacy of biopesticides based on the time of day you're applying. It, are there any sort of rules there or, or cautions that you might offer? Yeah, so in terms, yeah, so some of them, I, and I think a lot of this information, I think it's really important to read the labels because um, a lot of the, la the, you know, the companies that are putting out these products want them to be successful. And so they put a lot of information on that label um, to, to help you get them, use them, use them um, um, proper, properly. So yeah, there are definitely some that are formulated that tend to be maybe a little bit more sensitive to daylight, um, you know, so it's better to, you know, maybe apply them later, later in the day, um, those, those types of things. But again, reading that label, um, you know, making sure that when you're mixing, a, you know, especially a, a microbially active product, you know, that it's not sitting uh, for too long before it's, um, before it's being applied. Okay. Um, any guidance on commercial level mixed slash companion planting? I'm not sure, maybe Matt, if you yeah. can offer any additional context on that one, we can circle back uh, in, the, in the next question um, for that one. Um, I was curious, we have a lot of folks who are interested in um, compost tea and other like beneficial applications or, or developing things like that, that would ideally, I guess, compete on the leaf surface against pathogens and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have any advice, cautions, uh, insight into, into those sort of practices or, or that a notion anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there's a lot of interest in using different types of compost teas. And, and you know, as a researcher, it's always been challenging um, to research those types of things in a, in a replicated type of, of field trial scenario. And, and I would say that's true for a lot of these, a lot of the biopesticide products. Um, so I guess my one recommendation is, uh, is to maybe leave an area that you don't treat to see what happens if you don't use the particular particular products. Okay. Um, yeah, to make sure that you actually, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's always like leave some type of control. So you have your kind of your own uh, 
your own experiment on your own farm, kind of under your own conditions. Do you think, would that be like 10% of the plants or 10% of the area, something, something like that? Yeah, something, something like that. I think, I think, uh, you know, whatever seems reasonable given, yeah, the size of the, of, of the field that you're, you're treating. Okay. Um, we talked a lot, of, you know, a lot of this, like you said, is about prevention and proactivity and, and sanitation and all of that. I was wondering from the sanitizing that your, your space and getting prepared for the next season. So what mm -hmm. folks would be doing in December, January, February, uh, coming up, what would you say is, is the most effective or some of the most effective techniques that they should be doing to sanitize and really set the stage for a, um, for a, a good mm -hmm. st starting yeah, point? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think one of our one of our biggest challenges it, it, with bacterial diseases is, is wooden stakes, um, and and really the, the the ultimate recommendation is not to reuse wooden stakes. Or you know, if you're if you're going to reuse you know tomato stakes, you know, use them in a completely different crop family where if if there's bacteria or other pathogens associated with them, you know, they're they're less likely to cause an issue. Um, that being said, most people want to save their stakes for a lot of different, huge number of different reasons. Yeah. Um, and so one thing I would point out is that uh, bacteria associated with stakes um, are not sensitive to cold weather. So when you pull those stakes out and if you just put them behind the barn over winter, even in a polar vo vortex, it's not going to be cold enough to kill the pathogens. They're going to survive. I I maintain bacterial pathogens in the lab at minus 80 Celsius, <laughs> and then I can grow them back out and kill yeah. a plant. So bacteria are much more sensitive to heat. So I know a, a number of growers who have gone to kiln drying or heat heat treating stakes is a way okay. to be able to, to use them um, or doing some type of uh, sanitation dip. Um, there's a lot of different products that you could use that way, but really, they have to be cleaned first and then sanitized. It's a sanitation step, not a cleaning step. Okay. Um, as far as the physical space, greenhouses, high tunnels, things like that. Um, so I would say with high tunnels, making sure you get all the crop residue out that you possibly that you possibly clean. You know, cleaning. Um, you know, just general sanitation of surfaces. Uh, you know, making sure you don't have weeds and things like that. I think are going to be the most uh, most uh, critical. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, thinking about the, the tracking tool for the cucurbit downy mildew, um, there's some really nice, I, I always find that such a, a great tool to, to use and I'd recommend that to everyone. Um, for a grower who, you know, has some susceptible crops or is concerned about that and is watching it, what would you say as the, as reports are moving closer to Pennsylvania, what should the the tiers of escalation before them as they're preparing and, and getting their crops ready to in anticipation yeah. of that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so something I didn't touch on in my talk that I'll mention now is that what we've, what we've been finding with the uh, cucurbit downy mildew pathogen is there's actually two clades and there's, okay. there's what we call clade two, uh, which goes to cucumber and cantaloupe. And we always see downy mildew on cucumber and cantaloupe every year. It's, it's not a matter of are we going to, it's when are we going to. There's clade one of the pathogen that affects pumpkins and winter squashes um, that we only see every now and then. Um, and so really it's focusing on cucumber and cantaloupe first. And if you're following the monitoring and the forecasting, you know, as, as those, for, those risk bubbles get closer to us, that's when you wanna think about starting to apply, you know, fungicides to prevent it. And, and downy mildew really, if it's, it's better if you can get sprays on before you, you start to see downy mildew. I've, I've lost trials um, in that case. Um, but then also seeing where is it on pumpkin and winter squash, because you might not even have to worry about downy mildew on those crops. And, oh, and a lot okay. of years, we don't even have to worry about it on those crops. Okay, great. Um, I've got, I think, two more here stored up. If there are any other questions that folks want to share out in Q&A and chat, we'll keep an eye on those. And Tabitha is going to put the evaluation link in the chat box for folks to please grab that. Um, but the, the last two that I've got here, you mentioned Sudan grass for biofumigation, and I think uh, brassica, a brassica cover crop as well. Mm -hmm. 
would those for the brassica cover crops would that be a mustard variety or do you have a particular you know, there's a lot of talk about mustard as a biofumigant a few years ago right. is that still the the front line or yeah yeah there's still yeah a lot of different types of mustard crops and there's mustard crops that have have been bred uh, spe specifically to be used for biofumigation because they have um higher concentrations of the of the chemicals that are broken down um through the through the process so yeah do you have any um um variety names that you off the top that you could recommend or um should folks I, mean, I, think, uh, I think like caliente 99 is is one of the more is one of the more common ones okay um, i mean i think if you search online you can you can you can find a number of them that are are available okay great and how long roughly would those be effective you know if you were to put in a pretty pretty good crop is that short pretty short term uh, effectiveness yeah, I think I think it'll it, it it all depends on what level of pathogen pressure there was in that field to begin with. It'll it'll knock back the pathogen pressure so that if you go in, let's say a susceptible crop, you won't have, um, you know, hopefully the disease pressure won't be quite as is high. But then you would still want to try to you know continue crop rotation in that cycle as well to keep that pathogen pressure down. Okay. Um, and the last question I have here is uh, we, I've heard in a couple of our other prior presentations this year about uh, mention of the brown rugose virus and other things that are emerging uh, that, that may not even be here yet, but we're aware of out there. Um, can you say, say anything about that, that pathogen in particular and just any other things that folks should be keeping an ear out for in the, in the coming years? Yeah, so there, yeah, there are a lot of, of, of pathogens and diseases that are kind of on our radar screen that we're that we're concerned we're concerned about. Um, I would, you know, I would say with that particular virus, um, you know, when you if you suspect that you have something like that, you know, reaching out to someone like me or someone, in, you know, in, in the plant diagnostic clinic in the state that you're you're in, um, there's a, a, a process for getting that particular one identified. Um, but I, uh, something that's on our radar screen, we, we tend to think about what, what diseases are prevalent south of us and you know, what's starting to creep upward. And one of them for us is Southern blight, um, which is Sclerotium roxii, which is, is pretty common in Maryland and Delaware and on the Delmar, Delmar Villa Peninsula. Um, we've had uh, four or five cases of it this year in Pennsylvania. Um, primarily on on tomato, and so that's one that we're starting. You know, yep. that's where you know, uh, getting accurate diagnostics in terms of of what you're what you're dealing with is is important. Okay. Um, to to that end, I guess the one thing I'll I guess I'll end with this. Um, as I, I'm always encouraging folks in the field to be reaching out and sending in samples or photos or whatever. What would be um, the best way to get a, a quick response or a quick diagnosis or support from from your you or, or your colleagues there yeah yeah so from the plant disease clinic um you know i would say uh uh you know sending emailing pictures um is is beneficial i think you can you know if you're sending something in if it's commercial vegetable you can loop me in on it as well there's a lot of things i mean photography's improved tremendously everyone kind of has a yeah. you know has a phone with a good camera on it that you know if you send a couple of pictures i can kind of say oh yeah this is this is easy i can let you know what it is or no you know what i need to know a little bit more yeah maybe okay. we need to send something to the to the clinic and and i would say that's true for a lot of reaching out to a lot of extension educators across the state uh as well that we can we can try to do something you know and we we don't always you know i i won't say i'll guarantee a diagnosis from a picture but yeah um we can at least head off some of the common things that way okay great so. Well, that's all we, we have for, for questions. So I'll, I guess I'll leave it there. Um, I'm going to have Tabitha put the eval in the chat one more time. Please grab that, folks, before we uh, sign off here. But I want to thank uh, Beth Gugino for joining us today and closing out this series. Uh, I think your, your graphic at the end there really highlighted how complex IPM uh, is and can be. And uh, hopefully we've gotten at uh, uh, at least some of that with our series this summer. And uh, we look forward to seeing uh, all of you at uh, some future events and programming. So hope everyone has a good day and uh, say take care.